On November 13th, 2022, at around 4 a.m., four college students were brutally murdered. Each would soon become household names, known for their deaths, but remembered for their lives. Kaylee Gonsalves, she was 21 and born in Concord, California. Her family describes her as sociable, strong, and a hard worker. Kaylee was our middle child out of five. She was always competitive. She was smack dab middle, so Stephen and Olivia were a little bit older. Audrey and Aubrey were a little bit younger, so she kind of had to figure out where to fit in, and she definitely did. Maddie Mogan, also 21, was best friends with Kaylee since childhood. Maddie's family says she was known for her offbeat humor and her ability to make others laugh and smile. She was so great. She was she lit up every room she come in, and she was just so positive and fun, and uh, and we just we love her and miss her so much. Twenty-year-old Zana Kernodo grew up in Idaho and was a talented gymnast as a child. In high school, she played volleyball, track, and soccer. Zana was going to school for marketing. Zana was such a light in my life and so many others, and she knew and understood me more than anyone. Losing her is the hardest thing I've ever had to go through, and it has left me heartbroken. 20-year-old Ethan Chapin loved sports and country music. He was Zana's boyfriend, a triplet who was incredibly close to his family. We are eternally grateful that we spent so much time with him. And I want to remind you that that's the most important message that we have for you and your families, is to make sure that you spend as much time as possible with those people because time is precious and it's something you can't get back. Amazingly tragic, tragic story, tragic case, but it's going to be a trial. They are going to fight it. They want these charges dismissed. Motion to dismiss, October 26th, which is next Thursday um, in the case of the Idaho students who were murdered. We'll see what happens there. Um, but there's more things to talk about. First, let's take a look at the accused killer uh, back in, inside the courtroom. Here he is. Once again, walking in, you know, you look at him, we all know what he's accused of, so you kind of look at him a little differently, but um, I think everything we learned about him is that there was always something wrong with him, always something a little odd, you know, not just like a regular guy. There was something a little different. We heard statements from students who had him um, in, in school out, out west in Washington State, and it's it's... It's bizarre. So how about his family? Where's his family in all this? Well, we really haven't heard from his immediate family, uh, but the U.S. son spoke to the accused killer's alleged aunt because, you know, she was anonymous. She didn't give a name or anything. Um, and this is what the alleged aunt told the uh, U.S. son. She said her heart goes out to the victim's families, but she also feels the accused killer was not well and had battled for years with mental health problems. To me, he was humble and quiet. I didn't see any violence in him. But if you're not on the right medication, you can be triggered. I think he may have snapped. I don't have an answer for why he was depressed. I guarantee he had a wonderful childhood. Michael, his dad, is a wonderful man. He was a janitor, and his wife is a beautiful woman. She's a teacher, and they worked at the same school. She questioned on how she feels uh, he will cope if he gets life behind bars. His aunt shook her head and replied, I think he may try to kill himself. So definitely there's something off about him, but that's not going to be the defense. There's no defense like that. It's, it's, it's an alibi defense that he wasn't there. He was out for a drive by himself all night. Let's bring back in our think tank, Bernardo Villalona, Sue Ann Robinson, Ben Chu. Uh, ben, I, I just... They've got the motion to dismiss. I don't expect it to be successful, but it might give us a sneak preview of what some of the arguments will be at the trial. But from what we've heard, it seems like the basis of this defense case is, is that he has an alibi. And his alibi is something like he was out all night driving around by himself. That kind of sounds like what the killer did. Yeah, it's, it's not the strongest alibi we've, we've, we've ever heard, is it? 
No, not even close. Bernard, the alibi sounds like it's, it's a piece of evidence for the prosecution. Exactly. So, Vinny, I don't think that that's the defense that they're going to put forward, an alibi. I think what they're going to put forward is to say that the prosecution hasn't proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Because think about it, Vinny, if they're going to put a defense of an alibi that he was somewhere else, who are they going to put on the stand to testify about that? Is Brian Kohlberger the only person in a position to say that he was out driving all night? And does that make him and put him in a positive light? It doesn't. So I think they're just going to keep it to that the prosecution has proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Hmm. I know that's the standard in all, Sue Ann, but that's, I mean, if I'm accused of being a mass murderer in the middle of the night, uh, I would think I'd have a better story if I was factually innocent. Do you agree or disagree with me? I, I agree with you, but I'm still stuck on the anonymous aunt that wants to be distant but has so much to say. It's like pick a lane. Either you want to distance yourself from the case, you don't have anything to offer, or you have all of this stuff to say about his childhood, him being depressed. You don't know why he's depressed, but his, fam his childhood was great. Like, are you distancing yourself? Or do you have something to say? I feel like you need to pick a lane. If you're going to be a family member, either you're going to offer something or you're going to distance yourself. You can't do both. In terms of them offering an alibi that only he can attest to, that would be a tragic defense. That would be very, that would not be a good idea. I think their motion to dismiss, like Bernarda said, is going to go forward and say, listen, they don't have enough evidence to tie him to this place and time. And, and that's fine. Um, you know, the, the defense, as I always say, the defense is going to defend. Yeah, uh, they have to. And that's the way our system works. But Bernardo, what do you think they'll say about his DNA being on the knife sheath? So, Vinny, I think that they're going to challenge the DNA. It may be a battle of the experts where they bring an expert in to say that it wasn't reliable. So either they go that route or they're going to say that it's something about the collection of that sheet and how that DNA was allegedly collected uh, wasn't in the proper protocol or even say that possibly law enforcement planted it. But it doesn't work with the timeline because he wasn't a suspect until long after that was recovered. So there's a couple of avenues, but quite honestly, I don't think that they're going to be successful. That is the strongest piece of evidence that the prosecution has against Brian Kohlberger. Yeah, they, it can't be one of those defenses like in the OJ case where it was planted because they didn't have, they had the killer's DNA before they had his DNA to, to match it up. But uh, we shall see, folks. Again, next Thursday, big, big day in that case.